I think we'd like to get started now. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Indigenous Engagement Session for the Atlas Three launch weekend. My name is Julie Bone, and I am the Boreal Program Manager for Ontario Nature. This session will provide a brief overview of the work being done by the Indigenous Engagement Committee, followed by a panel discussion to help provide practical advice and suggestions for Atlasers on engaging with Indigenous communities and individuals while conducting Atlas bird surveys. As we're not able to gather in person today, I will provide a territorial land acknowledgement from where I reside. I'm calling in from Thunder Bay, which was built on the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation. Here we are all treaty people, and for those of us who live on the shoreline of the Gitche also known as Lake Superior, we are signatories to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. These are the homelands of the Anishinaabek, and I also acknowledge the Métis people who live and care for these lands. Through this land acknowledgement, I'm reconfirming Atlas III's commitment to conducting ourselves in the spirit and intent of reconciliation. In practice, this means making space for Indigenous leadership and knowledge systems in the work we're doing. It means respecting Indigenous protocols, ind Indigenous jurisdiction and laws when conducting our surveys, and strengthening dialogue with Indigenous communities when invited to do so, to explore to the fullest extent the way Atlas III can support their interests, rights, and unique relationships, roles, and responsibilities to this land. To start, Kaylin is going to walk us through some technical instructions. Kaylin? To begin our session, I'd like to introduce Russ Weber, who will provide a brief update on the Atlas's Indigenous Engagement Committee. Russ works for the Canadian Wildlife Service and lives with his family in a semi-wild rural area south of Ottawa. He has had the great fortune to spend much of his career as a biologist on the water, in the forest, and in the air over central and northern Ontario. He is also the co-chair of the Indigenous Engagement Committee for the Atlas. Uh, Russ, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Julie. So I'm just going to give a, a very quick overview of the um, of our committee, a little bit about who we are and what we do and what we've done, what we plan to do. I'll make a note just to start that our email addresses are there in the bottom. So if you have some questions or would like some follow-up, please feel free to uh, get in touch with Ted and I. So our committee, we, uh, we hope to encourage and support participation in the Atlas by Indigenous groups and uh, individuals. We hope to encourage and support respectful engagement and access to lands. And we do think the Atlas can contribute to the conservation and management goals of Indigenous communities. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we are learning as we go. So we're very open to feedback, but um, we welcome gentle and constructive feedback. Um, we are made up of representatives from the Atlas Three partner organizations, uh, as well as several individual volunteers. And like I said, we're open to feedback. And if somebody's interested in participating in our committee, um, Ted and I would be happy to, to learn. Next slide, please, Caitlin. So in November of last year, uh, we mailed out an introduction letter to the Atlas, um, sort of describing the Atlas in general to 130 plus First Nations in Ontario. Um, we've had a couple of really great webinar sessions in March. So one dealt with reconciliation uh, as a theme and another one gave us some ideas about conducting research with Indigenous peoples. Um, one of the things that we're working on and nearly finished with is some guidance and suggestions that uh, we hope will assist regional coordinators, atlasers and others with engaging with Indigenous communities. Uh, we're beginning the process of, of doing what we can as a committee to help regional coordinators uh, have conversations with Indigenous communities and groups, and so some of that is underway. And one of the big things that's coming up for us in the near future is uh, a stronger fundraising uh, effort with sort of a two-pronged area of focus. One is to help get an Indigenous uh, engagement coordinator involved with our um, uh, with our committee and another one is, has to do with compensation and honoraria for Indigenous guides, knowledge holders and atlers, atlers. So 
that's it for me and uh, I'll hand it back to Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. I just saw that Emily Jarvis has her hand up, but I don't know if participants are all muted or not. Um, Emily, if you had a technical question, I think we're going to put those in the chat. If you have a Q&A, you can add it to the Q&A. And I just wanted to stop just in case you had a question for Russ, and that's why you raised your hand. I don't see any questions in the q and I'm just going to quickly check the chat. Uh, Okay, sorry, Emily, I don't see your question there. We'll, we'll definitely come back um, to give you an opportunity if you have a question. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing our panelists who have joined today. Julie Servant is a French and Anishinaabe Kwe scientist living and working in southeastern Ontario. She earned a degree in biology and her to move easily between the fields of human health and ecology. Julie is an executive director for the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network and runner for the Indigenous Circle for Canadian Biosphere Regions. She spends her time learning land-based skills, playing outside, and playing Lego and Minecraft with her two children. Megan Young is an Anishinaabe Kwe from Garden River First Nation. She is currently working as a wildlife biologist for the Toronto Zoo studying blending with turtle conservation. She has a BSc in zoology from the University of British Columbia and multifaceted ecology conservation experience. She is an amateur birder and is passionate about indigenous inclusion in science, technology, engineering, and math. And Ted Chesky is with us from Nature Canada where he has worked for the past 15 years and has been the naturalist director, director since 2018. Ted is a veteran atlaser and he was extensively involved in the first two Ontario atlases. And much of his work has been influenced by his lifelong interests, knowledge, and passion for birds and nature. And he shares this passion for nature with his two children and three grandchildren in Gatineau. And Ted is also uh, co-chair of the Atlas Three Indigenous Engagement Committee, along with Russ. Um, and thank you all for coming today and sharing your time and expertise. We appreciate that. Uh, to start our conversation this afternoon, we have prepared a hypothetical scenario it could be something similar to what atlases may experience while out conducting bird surveys. And I'm going to read this out for us and then ask the panelists for their advice. And depending how much time we have, we will take questions from participants, which you can place in the Q&A after, after the, the panelists have had a chance to respond to this scenario. So atlasers Tim and Jim are driving to their first point count of the morning. As they turn off the pavement and onto a gravel road surrounded into the forest, they stop to read a sign next to the road. The sign informs them that they are entering the traditional lands of a nearby First Nation. They pause and discuss what this means for their survey plans and how they'll conduct themselves during the survey. They also consider that they may meet up with one or more members from the local First Nation community during their surveys, and they review how they may want to approach those conversations. Tim notes that the community might have at least some awareness of the Atlas since a letter introducing the Atlas was sent to the leadership of each First Nation in late 2020. However, the Atlasers do not know if most people in the community are aware of the Atlas and its activities, and they understand that showing up with binoculars unannounced could be disconcerting for people. So for the panelists, imagine you're in the car with Tim and Jim as they have these discussions near the sign. Um, what advice would you provide them? And uh, Julie, uh, would you be able to start for us? Uh, sure. So we had a, a, a look at this question beforehand. And one of the things that came to my mind was um, the seven grandfather teachings um, of our Ojibwe culture or my Ojibwe culture. And so I'll just kind of go over those ones really quickly uh, as something to sort of keep in mind. So the seven grandfather teachings show us how to live uh, life in a good way. And um, so uh, there's seven. First one, uh, humility. So this um, is understanding that you play a, a small part in the whole. Honesty. Um, so be honest with yourself and speak truthfully. Respect. Um, never take more than you need. 
and use all parts wisely, treat others as you would like to be treated, that sort of thing. Um, and what you give will come back. Uh, courage is, what are we on for? Courage, um, how to face fear and danger. So um, sometimes struggle creates opportunity for strength and courage. Um, next fifth is wisdom. Uh, this is to live life based on your unique gifts and to live through what you have learned. Uh, so it's sort of a open, quiet, um, kind and gentle, like gentleness. Um, truth is to know all of these teachings and that the journey is as important as the destination and love is to live these teachings. So that's the seven grandfather teachings. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Julie. Did you have any thoughts on advice maybe to give Tim and Jim if you're if you're in the back of the car um, and they're looking at the sign, how they might want to conduct themselves? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so um, but, so I was looking over this question yesterday and the first I asked my my nine year old, I'm like, what would you do? And he and he's like, communicate. So that was his first response. So communication is like key and, and it'll take you a long way. And so uh, I'll just start with that. I think we're gonna open this up conversationally to panelists, but uh, Megan, did you, did you wanna add? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Julie, and uh, both Julies, I guess, <laughs> for sharing that and for uh, having me. I think um, building off of what Julie said, just yeah, having those seven grandfather teachings in mind, I think applies to a lot of what I thought of when I read the question. So, I mean, first and foremost, I think is most obvious is being respectful to the land. So making sure, you know, you're not littering, you're not bringing any um, adverse substances, you're being as quiet as possible, not disturbing anybody. But I think also it's important to keep in mind and to acknowledge that the land is still the traditional territory of the First Nation. That's probably the purpose of the sign being there to begin with. Um, and part of that is acknowledging that the First Nations and First Nations people across Ontario are the primary rights holders on the land. So any rights that is given to uh, the government or to settlers is given by the treaties. And so we are all treaty people, like you said, uh, Julie. <laughs> The two Julie's definitely is uh, confusing, but yeah. Um, and so if you were to run into somebody, I think it would be best not to act as if you were entitled to be there, because even though it is not necessarily reserve land, um, but to ask permission to be there. So it's important to keep in mind that you might not have all of the context of what that traditional territory entails. So for example, not all cultural or spiritual sites are on reserve necessarily. Some of them are in the traditional territory of different First Nations and not all of them have been recorded on maps or have signs necessarily saying that they're there. So the First Nation community members might know that you're near somewhere that you're not supposed to be and you would have, you wouldn't have the context to know. So if, um, if somebody, if, if a community member is asking you either not to be there or to go somewhere else within the traditional territory, then it's probably best to trust that there's a good reason why and to not necessarily have to know what that reason is, but just to trust the community members. They wouldn't be asking you to leave without a good reason. Um, and maybe the best next thing, like next step would be to reach out to your regional coordinators and let them know that you were asked to leave from that area. And that can lead to a larger conversation between those regional coordinators and the First Nation or um, our, our Indigenous Engagement Committee. And I think further to that, just because the letter was sent to the community, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, leadership has seen that letter. Uh, the leaderships of First Nations are very, very busy. They get a lot of letters a lot of the times, um, and sometimes they don't get prioritized or they don't get seen right away. Um, and even if leadership does know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the community was informed or that information was shared to the, all of the community members. Even if they put out, say, a letter in the newsletter, not everyone would have the opportunity to read it. 
Um, so I think just making sure that when you're going to these conversations, like Julie said, being able to communicate why you're there and what your interests are and who you're representing would be very good and making sure that you have a basic understanding of uh, the atlas and how the atlas can help birds in general. Um, that would be good information to share and I would avoid assuming that it would be inherently good for the community as some communities do do their own bird um, or other species uh, monitoring. So just because this could add to that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have it already. So it's just good not to make assumptions. Um, and then I think the last or one of the last things I would add is just try to make a connection, maybe inviting them to join you or inviting them to um, go along in your surveys with you because there is that shared interest a lot of First Nations communities and First Nation community members, especially if they're out on the land, are likely interested in the well-being of the land and the species that are on it. So they might be interested in joining you or they might be happy that you're there. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that they might be interested in having a longer conversation or interested in joining you. And again, this is something that uh, we on the Indigenous Engagement Committee think that you should report back to the regional coordinator and maybe they can help to facilitate something like a presentation or a larger conversation with the community. Uh, I think a couple of things that I just wanted to add really quickly to sign off are things to avoid doing. So I would say avoid being defensive. Again, you don't know the context of why that First Nation community member is saying or behaving the way that they are. Um, that context is very important and it's impossible to know the context of what, for example, that community member has had interactions with people on the land before or how the community itself has had interactions with either scientists or government or other businesses um, or yeah what what kind of areas are around there so it's important just not to get defensive to stay calm and communicate and I would avoid using words like uh, taxpayers crown land federal land provincial land or uh, bringing up rights like especially like I said earlier you having the right to be there and just remembering that we're all treaty people um, and that you have responsibilities to the treaties as well, and that's to acknowledge First Nation land and to work with First Nations. And I think if you keep that in mind and the seven grandfather teachings that Julie shared, then you'll be on a great start. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, Ted, did you want to add anything to this conversation? Thank you, Julie. Absolutely, I would love to. Um, first, I want to thank um, I want to thank Julie for the sharing the grandfather teachings. Um, I thought of kindness and respect, and and as sort of the fundamental things. And uh, I I think I learned a lot in hearing them. I heard those messages and a lot of other things that I think are a really important part of how we deal with every day in people. Um, thank you, Megan, for your your. Learn, I'm learning a lot from you as well. These are these are all super points. And but I um, and uh, and also I have to say it's an honor to be sitting on the on the committee and on the panel. I should say with these people and on the committee as well and, and co-chairing it. Um, some of the points that I thought are worth bringing up um, are that um, Northern Ontario, the roadless north, and and the south are kind of being treated differently in the sense that. Um, all of I recognize all of Ontario is a traditional territory of, of one or, or more than one Indigenous peoples and there are Indigenous nations. And um, but the North and the roadless North is something that what the Atlas is doing is approaching those nations that they're, you know, tend to think of 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 it from people living in the South that there's, you know, this is just a big vast wilderness with no one there. But that land has been uh, occupied for for millennia by by people and it still is and um so what the atlas is trying to do is ar arrange uh permissions coordinate efforts in there so that it doesn't interrupt the sort of the traditional use of the land um so that's for the south it's it's a, a bit of a different story of course it's all still traditional land um one of the problems with the scenario is there aren't signs saying whose traditional land it is um, but it all is. Um, so I think these types of encounters are, are, are possible. And um, I, I really don't have anything more to add to the advice in, in terms of how, how you should deal with them, but you should never put getting that bird first. 
you should always put respecting people first and the way you deal with those interactions that has a much more lasting cause and purpose than finding a, you know, hoping to bump into a rare bird back in that habitat and risking a lot of other things in doing that. So please keep that in mind. Um, and the other thing I guess I wanted to say is it's, it's really worthwhile for, you know, the 156 people right now that are listening to this, if you're an atlaser, is to take some time to educate yourself about whose traditional lands you're on or you're going to for your atlasing. Learn about that. Um, you know, talk with your regional coordinator um, about, about that if, if you're, if you, um, in terms of, of permission, learning about if, if there's special moments or areas to avoid, but just do some self-education. Um, this atlas is, and I'm very proud of, of the, the folks involved in this atlas that they're taking the issue, the issue of, of Indigenous engagement in the spirit of the true spirit of reconciliation and trying to do it that way. I think that's extremely important. Um, and that, that's all I have to say at this point. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the great land acknowledgement as well, Julie. Muted myself there. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, Megan, and Ted for sharing that. It's, there's lots to process there. Um, if it's okay with the panelists, I thought we do have some questions coming in from participants and um, I could open those up and do, I'll, uh, I'll let you volunteer to respond. And if no one responds, then I'll, then I'll ask someone <laughs> to respond. So uh, the first question we have is, I've been e emailing with Nipissing 10 in the North Bay and Sturgeon Falls area, but have not been given official permission to go on the various lands that my squares are on. I'm feeling a little anxious about this and I'd hate to miss May when the birds are arriving and singing. Any advice? Thanks, Lisa, that's a great question. Okay, Megan, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, if you say you've been emailing, again, a lot of uh, people on the reserve, whether that's um, the leadership, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, whether that's the leadership or that's the Lands and Resources Department or whatever, um, whatever the departments are called, either the Lands Department, Resources Department, Environment Department, those are all the departments I mean when I say Lands and Resources, they have various names, but they're usually all called something like that. I would just try giving them a call. They're usually pretty busy. Um, a lot of emails get missed and phone calls are definitely a better way to build a connection and to just talk face to face. Um, yeah, I, I would say try giving them a phone call during, during business hours. Um, and if you can't get a hold of them, then maybe just calling the general band office number and addressing your concerns and they can maybe connect you to somebody who would be able to, um, to best answer your question. Um, thank you, Megan, for that advice. So uh, I think most uh, Indigenous communities have their numbers online too, so you could look that up and find the phone number for the main band council. Um, I see Ted's raised his hand too. Ted, did you want, also want to respond? Sure. I would just I would just encourage atlasers to be patient about about that. Um, and I agree totally. Well, um, talking to someone um, is much better. Like talking to someone on the phone is 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 a much better way of communicating than uh, emails or anything else. Um, you know, we sent that letter out back uh, several months ago, and we're, we we intend to follow up with every nation with a phone call. And and that's you know we're trying to do our best there, and we're learning along the way. But um, but just be patient. I know with the atlas, sometimes you don't you may have one square, and all of it might be within that territory. Um, fortunately, atlas is a five year project, so um, you know if you can't get to it this year, yeah, and and you're not comfortable that you don't have the permissions you need then please you know just wait until you until you get them and you can start that process thanks ted um julie just wanted to give you an opportunity do you have anything to, to add to that you're good oh. that covers it pretty good okay thanks thanks julie Okay, our next question comes from Catherine. She asks, will atlasers be given garb that will identify them as part of the atlas project? So some sort of identification that shows they're uh, an atlaser. I, I have to say, I'm kind of thinking about this a little bit because 
Um, if you're going out in the bush, especially in the fall, you might want to wear like hunter orange and stuff. So I, I don't know about on the Atlas side about special garb, but I would recommend no matter what, I don't, I don't know that much about birds, how they see color, but sorry about that, but hunter orange, yeah, it's always good. Yeah, definitely safety first. Ted, did you have something to add? Sure, just briefly. I know we've talked as a committee um, about having, not not garb, no, but, but having some sort of a guidance piece that ultimately could end up in someone's car. Like in the, in the last Atlas, I know there's there like a letter you can set there that, that can explain what you're doing if you're away from the vehicle and someone comes across it. But I, I don't think we've necessarily landed on anything, um, perhaps a card or something like that. Um, and I think there's there's possibilities to to include information about about a, a, you know the local for the, the territory that you're in, but again we I don't think we've gotten quite that far yet. But um, I, I, that is that is something that we're discussing and hopefully we'll get to. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ted. What's the best way to reach out to a First Nation to get permission for atlasing and how long should I expect it to take? I think you've already responded to that, that it does sound like um, probably the best way is by phone to the band council office. And um, I think the how long should I expect it to take is just be uh, patient as, as our panelists had suggested. Um, from Patrick, my square contains reserve lands. How do we find who the letter was sent to and and can we get copies of the letter so we know exactly what was sent and how do we find who we need to get permission from? I'm not sure if maybe <laughs> I might actually call on Russ too to join in here, but maybe Ted as the co-chair, uh, do you want to suggest what we might do here? Sure. Um, I, with reserve with re reserve lands, um, a volunteer outlisters should not be going on to reserve lands without permission. Um, that's you know, basically a, a, a that's, that's the, the guidance and, and uh, you should not you should not be going there. Um, I think it's something being worked out between the Atlas um, leadership and and the and the committee and the um, regional coordinators how that's going to roll out from um, across across the province and, and probably it's it's different in some areas some areas they're you know, the Atlas has a history and, and we know that some Atlasers and some coordinators have very good relationships with, with their individual um, nations in the South. And, and, and then there's others where that might not be the case. So I suspect it's gonna be like a, a, bit, a bit of a patchwork quilt across the province. And, um, and again, I, so I would just suggest some, some patience there. And, and I think I just like a lot of things in the Atlas, a lot of, um, a lot of this is going to be guidance that the outlisters get from the regional coordinators. And, and I know they're de depending to some extent on, on the indigenous engagement uh, committee to give them guidance. And all I can say is we're, we're trying to deal with that as, as, as fast as we can. And Russ, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, just to reinforce, I think that um, uh, if outlisters can be communicating with their regional coordinators. That's probably the first path. And then, uh, or as we go along the committee and, and Ted and Julie and I will be doing our best to try to help regional coordinators navigate some of these things. Um, so yeah, just to reinforce, talk to your regional coordinator and regional coordinators, um, feel free to reach out to Ted and I, um, and if you need our email address, get in touch with Kaylin and she can pass that along with you. So anyway, give us questions if you have them. Um, thanks, Russ and Ted, uh, for that. Um, yeah, I just had, there's some other questions in the Q&A about the letter. Uh, so it sounds, just to confirm, Russ, that the regional coordinators, I'm not sure if that letter is going to be posted publicly on the website or if that's something that the regional coordinators can share or, you know, I guess we'll see how those communications come out. Um, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so the guidance that we that I mentioned at the beginning there will have a copy of the letter that went out. And the first audience for this latest version of the guidance will be the regional coordinators. So very soon, I hope each of the regional coordinators will um, 
have the guidance and suggestions plus the content of the letter. And um, I think putting the content of the letter up on our website or some adaptation of that is, is one of the things we plan to do. So it should be available soon. Um, thanks, Russ. Uh, the, oh, Megan, you, did you have a comment too? Uh, I just had a quick clarification based on one of the earlier questions when we said to phone either the band office or the First Nation. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure who was asking, like if that was an Alistair or a regional coordinator. I just want to advise people that if multiple people from the Atlas are calling, that would probably a bit be a bit uh, much for the First Nation. So maybe that should be coordinated through uh, the regional coordinators as well. I just wanted to clarify. Um, thanks for that, Megan. I'm going to paraphrase a few of the, since this was with the q and I'll just paraphrase some things. Um, just in relation to COVID restrictions um, with Atlas saying this spring and summer, and um, I'm just wondering if Ted or Russ wanted to kind of comment that and then also open up to Megan and Julie about, uh, you know, how communities maybe are responding to this and sensitivity of having outsiders come in and that sort of thing. If, if, if you want to maybe discuss that a little bit. Okay. Go ahead, Ted. <laughs> um, I think this goes, this goes back to the reserve land um, and the North comments we made before, um, you know, working, working in traditional territories in the roadless North um, is, is going to be contingent on, um, on permissions and arrangements and all, all and, and the communities there all have their own COVID protocols and stuff. So yeah, I, I think until till there's a green light, you, you don't go there. And that's certainly with reserves, as, as I said before, and, and may want to hear from Megan and Julie on this, but you definitely don't go onto a reserve. And, and maybe, maybe you can explain, ask Megan or Julie, just to explain to folks here, because the difference between reserve land, traditional land, because there, I think there's probably that's there's confusion out there and, and it's worth hearing from you guys what, what that means and a little bit of brief history and on, on the difference. Julie or Megan, do you want to take that one, one of you? I can try kind of like big what you're asking. <laughs> um, so I guess for a birder, reserve lands is gonna be where um, the community is primarily located, like centralized. And then the traditional lands are gonna be surrounding lands. Um, which I don't know how to put this, I need help. I can try to jump in. <laughs> Sorry, unless I interrupted you, Julie. No, please. <laughs> um, I was just going to say a really easy way to figure out where reserve lands are is on Google Maps. Um, there's actually like a slight difference of color on where the reserve are, reserves boundaries are. Um, and I think it's like slightly shaded gray or something along those lines. But yeah, you should be able to see it if you zoom in close enough. Um, and then, yeah, like Julie was starting to say, the traditional territories are just kind of where um, people from that First Nation would have used the land traditionally, like um, pre pre colonization, pre settler times. Um, and so that territory wasn't necessarily encapsulated in the treaties. Um, I don't want to go too much into treaty history, but from my understanding of the treaty teachings that I've been giving, uh, given by my teachers is that the, the treaties were meant to be a, we will share this land with the settlers. Um, and so it was really the reserves, according to like our understanding of the treaties were where we would live the majority of the time, but we would still have access to the lands throughout the traditional territory. Um, and obviously that hasn't been quite what has been interpreted over time, but um, the traditional territories are still used by many First Nation communities, and especially now with the ability to travel, it might not always be community, like there is a lot of overlap between the different communities that use the different First Nations, uh, First Nation 
traditional territory, sorry. Um, and so those could be used for picking medicines, for hunting, for fishing, for, like I said earlier, for spiritual sites. Um, I'm sure there are other cultural activities that I'm missing off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, so those traditional territories might be used for all those activities, but the reserves are very defined. And from a technical legal standpoint, the uh, leadership only has jurisdiction, like where the laws, for example, apply to the reserve. So while for COVID, they could say close the boundaries of the reserve and only allow um, community members or only allow people that live on the reserve to do so to access that land, they wouldn't be able to do that for the traditional territory in general. I hope that that helps. <laughs> Yes, Megan, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, have any Indigenous communities said that they would like to get involved? Um, I'm going to ask you, Russ, just to give the, the highlights. I think you, you may have touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but maybe just to add to that. Yeah, I think we had eight uh, responses to the introductory letter um, that was sent in November of last year. There may be some additional ones coming in that I'm not aware of. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is uh, sort of do some follow-up connections with those eight communities, connect uh, those communities with the regional coordinators. Um, and that's leading to some conversations about um, data sharing and land access. And of course, COVID is part of that conversation as well. So um, uh, anyway, so we've had a good start and hopefully we'll have um, some additional contacts. I think everybody's a little distracted now with the pandemic so likely over the next year we'll start to have some additional um, expressions of interest thanks julie thanks russ um will the atlas data be shared with indigenous communities i take that one too yeah so um it, it's a long tradition of atlas uh, atlases for the data to be public that's the very central goal of this atlas as well. Um, so yes, the data will be available to any who have an interest in, in the data. And I think there's several of the atlas partners that would be quite interested in, in assisting indigenous communities with accessing the data and maybe um, even providing some summaries as we go along. Um, so this is probably, you know, toward the later part of the atlas, but uh, I think Communities and others that are interested in, in accessing the data and maybe having some difficulties should just reach out again, maybe through the regional coordinators and, uh, and we can help out as much as we can. Thanks, Russ. Um, I also just had a comment here about not wearing hunter orange during the wild turkey season. Um, I'm not a wild turkey hunter. I don't know if anyone on the panel can respond to when we may or may not want to wear hunter orange. Is any, does anyone want to answer that? We can't really open it up to participants. It has to come from the panelists. If not, we can make sure we respond uh, later today through chat or something. You can, there's a spring and a fall hunt for turkey. So you can look it up the hunting regulations for your location. Okay. Would there be any reason not to wear hunter orange? Yeah, because the turkeys can see you. So you're, so, well, you're disturbing you're the, the hunters. Okay. Yeah, you're disturbing. Yeah. Okay, so good to keep in mind there's some seasonal, you know, considerations of not disturbing turkey hunters too and when we go out. Okay, I think we've made it through um, the q and I just wanted to give uh, one last opportunity for anyone who would like to ask any final questions. Oh, here we go. Um, has any thought been given to a generic sign to put on the dash stating the, the purpose of the parked car? I think um, I, I think Ted kind of uh, discussed, you mentioned this, didn't you, Ted, that this was done in the previous Atlas. So uh, it sounds like there is discussion on, on having that same sort of thing. So if someone comes across your car and you aren't there, that, that they can understand that you're part of the Atlas and what you're doing. But I think that those things are all in the works right now. I don't know, Ted, if you know any more about timing or it's just in the works with everything else. Um, I guess just the last question to put out there, um, 
what sort of resources will be available to people uh, possibly through the, the Atlas website to learn more about uh, what the Indigenous Engagement Committee is doing and, and, um, and resources that they could possibly use? Yeah, I can try that first. Um, so we're just sort of beginning. We have some draft materials that will be going up on the web um, fairly soon. So we're in the early stages of that. Um, I think it's possible that the guidance that I mentioned earlier uh, is a good candidate for um, the website. Um, so I don't know, I think we'll probably come up with ideas as we go along and some of those ideas we'll be able to pursue. But um, So I don't think we've got a lot of content up there now, but progressively over the next couple of years, hopefully that will grow. So. Yes, and I, I hope we'll be able to give notice to Atlasers that there's when as new material gets up there that we think people might want to check in. Um, there's just an update through the chat that the dashboard sign is available for download now um, off of the website. It sounds like so maybe this afternoon some of the um, some of the folks working on the on the uh, launch today we'll just see if we can get that into the chat and some of the, some of the future sessions so people know where they can go and find that would be. Uh, be helpful. I just see Ted has his hand up to you. Uh, yeah, I just I'll, I'll, as well as what um, Russ said in what I mentioned about about some sort of print type um, resources. Of course, we we talked about having more sessions like this or like the reconciliation 101 that sort of thing. I, hopefully, that'll be part of the an ongoing part of the atlas and. Atlasers come and go throughout the cycle, the five-year cycle. Um, so I, it's uh, my feeling is it's probably worth worth doing things like this with some, some sort of regu regularity over the course of the atlas and and um, yeah and 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 have it recruiting more uh, indigenous people into our our indigenous engagement uh, committee as well. Um, so that you know the the weight doesn't sit on Megan and Julie and, and John who wasn't able to uh, to be part of this today. Uh, thanks for that, Ted. Well, we've come to the end of our, oh, sorry, Julie, go ahead, please. Um, I think we had discussed maybe some means of collecting feedback from maybe the regional coordinators about what kind of resources um, outlisters are looking for as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely be reaching out continue to reach out with the regional coordinators as we proceed to and and Russ had talked about that we're learning as we go so as we get feedback and more then that can come back to the Indigenous Engagement Committee and we can discuss how to best respond to it and, and support as needed so thanks. Um, since we are at the end of our session I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for sharing their expertise and experiences with us this afternoon and also thank everyone who's on the call for attending today and uh, we wish we had more time today because there's a lot of things we could we could spend time digging into, but this is the beginning of a conversation on increasing engagement with Indigenous communities through Atlas 3. And the Indigenous Engagement Committee uh, hopes to continue these discussions with volunteer Atlasers, and we will keep you informed of upcoming opportunities for learning and sharing. So thanks again, everyone. Um, our next Atlas 3 launch session is on significant species starting at 3.30, and if you would like to stay for the next session, this window will remain open. <laughs>